Hi, um, thank you for coming. And um, I hope we'll have a very interesting discussion today. Uh, the uh, person who is de designated to be the moderator, Tikon Diadko, is, uh, uh, couldn't be in Perugia. And um, we are hoping that, uh, that we can connect with him uh, during the panel and, and, and hear from him. Um, so I will fill in as uh, the moderator. I'm Jonathan Stein, the managing editor of, of Project Syndicate. Um, and all the way on my left uh, is Marina Constantinoyou of the Southeast uh, Europe Media Organization. Um, directly to my left is Arzu Gaibula from uh, the uh, Azerbaijan Internet Watch. And, uh, and to my right is Rina Truvacin of, of, of Klup in Kyrgyzstan. And, um, we're going to, people have various different kinds of presentations. Um, Marina is going to read hers and uh, Rinat has a, has a, a slide presentation. Um, Arzu will uh, speak from her notebook very eloquently, I'm sure. And, um, uh, and I, I will uh, uh, ask a follow-up question if there, if there is time. Oh, we have, we have Tikon, good, uh, very good. Um, so why don't we do it in this order then? We'll, we'll hear from Marina first and then from, uh, then from Rinat uh, and then from Tikon and from, then from Arzu. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, and I hope uh, that everybody will keep it, you know, their, their initial presentation to about 10 minutes. I'd very much like to leave enough time uh, at the end for one or two questions. Um, so let's just uh, get started uh, immediately. I know there's a lot, uh, it's a big panel and there's um, a, a lot to say. So Marina, um, go ahead. Hello, I'm Marina Constantinoiu. I'm a Romanian journalist, first of all, um, and also a board member of CIMO, which is a uh, Southeast European network of uh, journalists. <clears throat> When I woke up this morning, I uh, had an idea. Although the internet in my hotel room was with an awful signal, I went to Google because I wanted to search for a radio station, Radio Monte Carlo. It was the first time for me to search for Radio Monte Carlo and I had a reason. I was born in a country where uh, in 1952, someone was imprisoned for the only guilt of listening to foreign radio station, to a foreign radio station. And the name of the radio station was Radio Monte Carlo. Uh, this radio station is airing music and news. This morning, Queen was singing Heaven for Everyone. It is both strange and horrible that in 2022 we are facing hell and listening to music about heaven. I was born in Romania, a country where my grandfather, a journalist and lawyer, was sentenced to 18 years in prison, prison for the only guilt of wanting to listen to the news and some good music. What I want to say is that the alternative in communism and communist Romania was no news, was only fake news, was only propaganda, was only mystification of the truth. The father of the KGB named NKVD brought us in Eastern European countries the mystification of the truth. What we are facing today is also the mystification of the truth coming from this uh, Eastern part of the world who brought us the war. We called it in Romania the mind's blackout. This is what was our normality for 50 years. Being informed was a guilt 
but also a danger for the communist state. There is a say, someone informed is someone powerful. Communists did not want powerful citizens. Communists wanted powerful informants. And as you can see, information is the key word here. Doesn't matter where or when. We supposed to speak here in Perugia about media and challenges we are facing in East European countries. The most important one that I would like to underline is the one transforming journalists into time bombs. Open any time for corruption to survive. It happens in Romania, it happens in many countries in our region. We speak here in Perugia about innovation in media, about social media, about citizen journalism, about data, metaverse, and all things like that. But few speak about the real challenges, daily challenges for us as journalists for this profession, about the reality of so-called newsroom where we work today. Three, four people, not more, working seven days a week, more than 10 hours daily, in many cases underpaid or without a salary for months. The profession itself, not only the journalists, is under big threat. In Romania and in other East European countries, everything was done in order to destroy the independent media. Someone asked me who has this interest. Uh, it happened for the last 30 years. We had different political parties, different colors in the government, but it happened. Only a few remained and continued the, doing their job properly in this profession. We count on fingers from one hand big names of real journalism in our countries, investigative journalists, for example, well known locally or abroad. When Westerners are looking at the European part of Europe, they give Hungary as a bad example. But Hungary is not unique, not at all. In other countries in the region, journalists are killed or threatened for their work. Others are facing compromise campaigns. We have now, nowadays, since I think three or four days, an ongoing compromise campaign targeting a journalist who writes about uh, fake um, PhD diplomas of our political leaders. Many others are facing underpayment, as I told you, or no payment, decredibilization or loss of jobs. This led to the depopulation of the uh, newsrooms and to the disappearance of many of our news newsrooms in the end. For us in this part of Europe, this was the main reason for weakness. Not the challenges represented by the online media. Online was not an enem enemy, it could be an ally, but in the end, uh, this was not an issue for us. Our enemy was the cohort of local media owners who destroyed their own businesses by promoting their political interests and dirty businesses. And by surrounding themselves with yes men ready to modify the editorial agenda according to, the, to their interests. This was the easiest way that made possible the destruction what, uh, of what could be the flourishing business in the country, in a country where we were starving for information after the fall of communism. 
And I think we already lost the war. And I'm very sorry to say it because I'm, I st I've studied journalism at the university. I'm teaching journalism at the university. And I wanted to be a journalist since I was an embryo. But I have to say that we lost the war. We are weak already in front of the fake news and uh, this factory of misinformation surrounding us in on the social media, but also via mainstream media journalists. So there is no journalism, real journalism, without support. And Russia's invasion in Ukraine has underlined again and again the essential role of independent ethical journalism in assisting citizens to make love life or death decisions informing the world and holding the powerful to account. Thank you. Moving on, let's turn it right over to you. Um, yeah. Okay, hello, my name is Renato Tukhvacin. I'm from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, may I have my slides on, please? Okay, and today I'm going to talk about prospects of press freedom in Kyrgyzstan. And you can write to me on Twitter. Um, so Kyrgyzstan is a small country of about 6 million people. It uh, used to be part of the Soviet Union. It's located between Kazakhstan, China, China and Uzbekistan. And it's a poor country with small GDP and even smaller per capita. 35 percent of population considered poor. And we work at this country, we call it Club Media, and most of our uh, journalists are students of our media school who we teach ourselves. Uh, still, uh, in 2018, together with OCRP and Radio Azatik, we managed to win Tom Renner Award from IRE for one of our investigations, and in 2000. 21, we managed to win a uh, Sigma Award for data journalism. Um, also, Kyrgyzstan, uh, I cannot call it like completely free or democratic, but it's better than anyone else around, like much better. Um, uh, this is old uh, data for 2020. Now we are a bit uh, lower in the rankings, but still much better than anybody around us. Um, and, of course, currently, uh, government pressures journalism, journalists. We are harassed online, sometimes there are rallies uh, under our uh, windows, windows of our office. Sometimes uh, authorities try to search offices of journalists looking for drugs. Um, like, recently, one of the leading investigative journalists in Kyrgyzstan was uh, his office was searched, they found some marijuana. He was jailed for a night, but then let go. Investigations still continue, but usually if somebody finds drugs on you, you stay in prison. Uh, another media, Next TV, uh, they produced an article on uh, participation of Kyrgyz soldiers in, in the war in Ukraine, which was not true because there are, of course, no Kyrgyz soldiers. But uh, this article was deemed extremist, uh, their office was closed and they were prohibited pro from operating, but then there was court. Uh, the article still was considered extremist for some reason, but the entire organization mm, was not deemed extremist and they were allowed to uh, continue working. Uh, there is also another lawsuit investigating some other media, Cactus Media. So basically, it's some pressure then go back, pressure, go back. So it's, I think, pretty uh, typical for uh, developing democracies. But we are under influence of Russia. They consider us like territory of influence or like part of their empire or like whatever new obsessions they have. We are usually figure somehow inside of it. But we view Russia not necessarily as so bad, but as a, some sort of like, you know, evil time machine. Like a twisted mirror through which you can look and see how your government will try to limit your freedom. 
And it's very good because if you can think about strategy of your adversary, you can think about your own strategies that will help to protect yourself. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, but what I wanted to tell you, I want to tell you one um, well-known Russian story about a duck that was called Grey Neck. So once upon a time, there was a duck called Grey Neck, and unfortunately, it broke its wing, and it could not fly away with the rest of the ducks. And it stayed in its pond. And, of course, winter came. And water started freezing on the edges of the pond. And together with uh, this ice ring and winter came a fox. And so pond started gradually freezing, decreasing, and at some point during the winter, duck was frozen solid into the ice and was eaten by the fox. Why I'm talking about it? Because it's an analogy with uh, our media and our government. What, not our government, our government is still not doing it, but they are actually considering doing it now. Sometimes they take laws that are directly copied from Russian Federation, and they forget to replace Russian Federation with Kyrgyzstan. And so what Russian Federation did, and our government is probably considering doing, it takes successively more uh, strict laws to limit freedom of press. But the point is that at first these laws do not hurt too much. So, for example, in Russia, almost all independent media were asked to mark themselves as a foreign agent. What it means, if, if you publish anything online, article, tweet, Facebook post, you need to label that this post was published by foreign agents. And you know how Russian media responded? They freaking complied. Um, and they went with it, like, just, just, just put this little disclaimer, it doesn't hurt, everyone in the US do it. Then a little bit uh, closer to present time, uh, media were prohibited to call war in Russia war. They were asked to call it special operation. But it's fine, we still have, you still have your media freedom. Just if you happen to mention war, maybe like start out. And you know what media did? They complied. Ring of ice became a little bit tighter. And at last, Russian media were asked to cover events of Ukraine war, of Russian war in Ukraine, only from the sources that belong to the Ministry of Defense of Russia. Everything else was deemed fake, and by this time, most of the Russian media, they just had to shut down. And for example, there is this media, Nova Gazeta, Nobel Prize laureates, and one of the reporters, extremely brave woman, Kostuchenka, she went to Kherson, she wrote an article. Nova Gazeta published it, but then Russian Roskomnadzor asked it to delete, and these articles were deleted. And basically, we expect that something like this at some point will start happening in Kyrgyzstan. So basically, if you want to see how Russian duck, how eaten Russian duck looks, that's how. You go with a posture, with, with stars, like no war, not война, and you get a detained for that. Yeah, great. Um, so the question is, how do we break this ring of ice? And I say that media should be ready to break laws, like literally. If there are some stupid laws, and again, I don't say that Russian media did something wrong. They are brave, they tried their best, and after most of the independent uh, Russian media uh, closed down voluntarily, so many like independent YouTube channels, uh, Telegram accounts emerged, maybe it's good. But I still believe that media as institutions, they were being preserved. I sincerely hope so that they were being preserved. So if you want to uh, have your media and have your press freedom, you need to be ready to break laws. So if at some point in Kyrgyzstan, 
will ask us to like label our materials as la uh, materials by foreign agents, will disrespectively refuse. Um, but when I say be ready, what I mean by be ready? We'll make sure, and we already do it, that every reporter in our organization, every employee, understands that at some point we will be breaking laws. And if they want to leave us at this point, please, by all means, do. We will not have hard feelings. We work together with you um, really well. But I'm pretty sure that Kyrgyz state doesn't expect that, and Russian state didn't expect that somebody would raise a lot of fuss about it. We want to fight, but we want to fight on our terms when it's convenient to us. Not when there is like some country or world chattering events that need to be covered and there are like no independent media. Uh, the second thing, we need to be prepared for exile. And again, I'm not talking about like psychological readiness. I'm talking about having office in a European country, having at least two reporters working for our media from there. And so if we are shut down for some reason in Kyrgyzstan, if all of us are arrested or killed or whatever, our media will continue working. And you know, as Drew from OCRP always says, whenever you face adversary, you need to understand their cost-benefit analysis. And if our state realizes that even if they do something with us that will cause international outcry, but they will not stop our activity, we will feel safer. So basically, make sure that everyone knows that we will not stop uh, working. And that's basically, I think, everything that I wanted to say. And you can uh, reach me on Twitter or via email. And after this session, I think we will take your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Renat. Do we have uh, Tikhon? Is he with us? And can he hear us? I can hear you. I um, hope you can hear I me. I can't see him. There we go. Tikhon, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, it's good that you're going next because um, maybe you can follow up a little bit on what uh, what uh, Renat said. Y you're um, you you're the editor in chief of 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 uh, of of TV Doge TV Rain as we know it in English, um, and uh, you've now shut down and 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 left the country. Um, what do you say to this uh, this uh, implied criticism by Renat that, okay, maybe not implied criticism, but that you followed the, the, the law when you were told to register as a foreign agent. Did you actually, did you do this? Did, you, did, did that happen? And, and well, what, so, and, and, yeah. and, and oh, okay, I'm sorry, and let me just add, add a follow-up so that you can just speak. And, and what is the situation now? Are you continuing to work? Are you continuing uh, to to uh, to do reporting or, and and how? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I would really love to be now in uh, Italy, Perugia, and I was planning my trip there, but the situation changed uh, uh, for uh, all of them. Um, I will um, I will give you information about the current situation, but first of all, I wanted to end to to comment on what uh, Renat was saying now, because he unfortunately was not completely correct. If uh, Russian media complied to the uh, to, to the idea of not calling the war war, uh, and if Russian media complied to the idea of only giving information from Russian self-defense, then I would not be in Georgia now. I would be in Moscow, in my apartment, and I would continue my work there. But since our, our education and a lot of other media they were doing normal journalism, saying that white is white, black is black, war is war, uh, and that uh, there are more sources of information than Ministry of, uh, of, uh, of this, uh, Defense. That's why all these media were shut down and a lot of journalists were forced to leave the country. Uh, so um, as, as for the foreign agent, uh, yes, our TV station was uh, designated as foreign agent uh, in August uh, um last year in August, and uh, we were following this rule because it was nothing. It, it, it meant nothing for our viewers. Uh, but if we did not do it, uh, it's, 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 very, it's very brave to say that you should break the law. I don't want to break the law and uh, pay. Uh, if, if, we, uh, uh, if we do not follow this law, for the first time, not mentioning that we are, were, were an agent, we would pay 
200,000 rubles, then 1 million rubles, then 5 million rubles, and then I will go in, in jail as, a, as an editor-in-chief. Would it be useful for my viewers if I'm in jail? Or would it be better if I say these 24 words about foreign agents with laugh, and our viewers were laughing, but our website was not blocked, and I was able to continue doing, uh, doing what I've been doing? I think in, in this, it's, it's obvious that Russia is an authoritarian state. Now it's worse than an authoritarian state. Then you have a choice. Uh, you follow some stupid rules, which are not, it is not critical to not follow these rules because it's nothing, it's just 24 words. No one, no one gives it, but no, no one paid attention to it. Or you, uh, or you uh, have no possibility to continue working. I think in authoritarian states, the, the answer is, is obvious. With the situation with the war, everything was different. Because uh, when we, um, we, we were working like a normal uh, media here, we were given information from all the sources. We, uh, we were calling war, war. But then there was a new law was, uh, was um, adopted by, by the parliament saying that if you call the war, war, and if you give the spread so-called fake news information about Russian military, you, you could face up to 15 years in jail. And that's when we decided that we should stop, um, we should stop operating. And uh, a lot of our journalists decided to, to leave the, the country. So um, I, will, I will probably start from the beginning. The situation with the media in Russia has never been easy over the last 20, 20, 20 plus years since the beginning of the presidency of Vladimir Putin. And uh, every, every year or every month, they were, uh, they were ad adopting new and new restrictions uh, for the media. For example, our TV station was uh, excluded from um, major cable and satellite networks uh, in Russia in 2014. And uh, they, they were more and more uh, restrictions such as this foreign agent law, such as the uh, restriction on uh, on advertising, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's it's it doesn't have any sense to talk about it now after February 24th, because because now April 9th there is no independent media in Russia anymore. The page of Russian more than history, uh, the page independent journalism in Russia has has been turned. There is no independent journalism in Russia within the country anymore. For example, just um, an hour ago, uh, the last independent media, uh, the last, um, I would say, popular independent media uh, was blocked in, uh, in, uh, in Russia. Of course, the, the journalists of this media, they are not in Russia uh, for several months. But still, now people in Russia could only access this media uh, while using uh, VPN or something like uh, like this. So, what happened with um, our TV station and what happened with Dorst will show the picture of independent media in Russia. Uh, since the beginning of the war, we started uh, working 24-7, uh, telling our viewers that about what what was happening in uh, in Ukraine. And uh, we saw the enormous requests from the people to the independent information because only on YouTube, I'm not mentioning other platforms, only on YouTube we had 25 million views per day, which, uh, w which also means the level of, uh, of uh, support of the war. I mean, the, the level is not that high as we are told by, by the state media because if uh, so many people are interested uh, in uh, getting independent information, then of course they, they do not support support this war. But it's a it's a different discussion, different different uh, conversation. Um, on the first day of the war, um, up in in um, I think four hours after the beginning of the war, I received a call from Roskomnadzor. Roskomnadzor is a regulator of the media in Russia. And the woman from Roskomnadzor, she was very nice to me, uh, um, just like, uh, uh, you know, um, 
the prosecutor could be very nice when he's uh, sitting with you in the, in the dark room. And she was telling me, Tikhan, it, it was the first time ever I was talking with someone from Roskomnadzornos. And she was telling me how professional I was, how, how well prepared I am for all the situation. And uh, she was telling me that, of course, she's sure, she was sure that I realized the, the importance of spreading on the real information. And I said, of course. And she said, okay, good luck. And I said, good luck to you. Have a nice day, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but it was like the first, the first bell. Um, so uh, then in a, in a few hours, Roskom Nadzor released a statement saying that all the media should only spread real information about the war and not spreading fake news about the war. Okay, this was just a statement. But then uh, some media, and our media as well, we received a, um, a letter from Roskom Nadzor uh, in which they told us to uh, take down one of our articles. It, it was uh, an article about the first hours of the war uh, and um, there was an information about uh, deaths among civilians. Uh, we uh, we took down this article because if we didn't, we our website would be blocked. Uh, and um, uh, but we uh, we wrote another art article about the fact that we took down an article in which there was an information about the deaths among among uh, civilians. Um, and then on March 1st, uh, Tuesday, a uh, website of Dorsa was blocked without any uh, information. Uh, then we received an information that police was going to, to search our, our office. It never happened. Um, then on Thursday, police came again. Uh, um, no, on Friday, when this law about so-called fake news information about the Russian military was was adopted by the Duma. We decided that we should stop operating because we realized that we had a choice. Whether we became the part of the press office of Ministry of Defense uh, or we continue working like uh, we've been doing over 12 years and we go to jail. We decided that we should stop operating and continue doing something from uh, from a different place. And now we are considering our options about how and where we will relaunch DOS. But for now, uh, several of our journalists and me, me as well, we decided to launch our own YouTube channels and uh, and spread information about Ukraine on on, on this platform. Uh, it is uh, very. Uh, the re request to it is very high. For example, our uh, YouTube channel, mine and my wife, who who used to be news director at Tigrain, we we only in three weeks we got more than 160 thousand viewers, uh, and we get a lot of uh, a lot of feedback from from uh, from Russia and from a Russian audience. But the fact is that in Russia, there is no independent journalism anymore. Uh, all independent media are, are shut down. Uh, all independent and big independent media are, are blocked and uh, access to them is possible only with uh, VPN services. Um, all, almost all uh, social media are blocked as well, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And now we are waiting for, for YouTube to be, to be blocked as well. So the situation is it's pretty, it's pretty terrible. Uh, thank you very much, Tikhan. And I, I, I would like to ask a follow-up question, but I won't, um, because I'd like to leave time for uh, perhaps somebody from the audience has a question that they'd like to ask. I'd like you to stay on the line. Please don't hang up until the panel is over. And now I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to um, Arzu, and maybe you can um, compare the situation in Azerbaijan with that in Kyrgyzstan and Russia. How is it different? How is it the same? Um, do you agree with uh, Tikhod and Rinat ab about uh, the, the strategy of you know, accommodating so that you can keep going or watching out that the ice isn't getting too thick? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kept on thinking of how the situation in Azerbaijan is similar or different, and especially the point about, you know, breaking the laws and whatnot. But, like, if you have your journalists jailed, then who is going to break the law? Who's going to keep the news um, from, you know, getting published? The ones who are outside of the country. The ones who are outside of the Second world is outside of the country if you are serious about operating in such restrictive regimes. And that's, and that's I think, this, this, this story or example of Azerbaijan because when, you know, I was thinking of what to talk about. You know, there's, there have been so many things happening in Azerbaijan in the last decade, more than a decade. The decline in, in media freedom has been so um, immense and on so many different levels, you know, from traditional ways of cracking down the media, you know, jailing, arrests, um, intimidation, blackmail, to new forms of intimidation. You know, we, we saw how websites were getting blocked, how um, even before they were officially blocked in 2017, they were getting DDoS, how um, after getting blocked, you know, after finding alternatives uh, of you know, being accessible in the country, how still they were getting um, uh, targeted through various forms, whether it was account hacking or, you know, content removal requests and, and whatnot. You know, it, there's never really been a moment where you could take a breather as a newsroom or as a journalist and be like, okay, so this is what's going to happen next. I need to, like, re- um, structure the way I operate my newsroom, redo everything, and escape. And we have obviously seen how in the years of this very um, intensive ways and forms of crackdown, uh, an exodus of journalists from Azerbaijan. You know, first uh, starting somewhere around 2012, 2013, 2014 was kind of this big year of unprecedented crackdown on um, media practitioners in general, uh, you know, raiding of offices, like in the case of Radio for Europe, Azerbaijan service, um, changing of laws. And yes, there was this moment when this, 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 yeah, the exodus happened. You know, journalists left, they um, reshaped their uh, newsrooms. Uh, they reshaped them in a way that they would operate from abroad. But then to operate from abroad and produce news, you still need to have people on the ground who would be doing the research for you, who would be doing the stories for you, who would be doing the investigations for you, talking to officials, talking to people who live across the country. And that in itself was a challenge because a, who would take the risk to work with an exiled media that's already been all over the news, whose um, uh, journalists have already been prosecuted and persecuted and continue to face intimidation in, in, uh, from the government, from the authorities. And once you take that risk, how do you make sure that your safety is not um, compromised? Like how you, once you're on, on a reporting trip, you know, you don't get um, detained. And they did take that risk. You know, a lot of the, the, the journalists working for exiled media ended up in this new um, environment and this new atmosphere of crackdown where there were no safety mechanisms. There are no safety mechanisms now as well. I mean, it's 2022 and nothing has really changed um, to the point where, uh, you know, saying that you're a journalist could already be a threat in itself because uh, you don't really have anyone that could protect or defend you. Uh, there's, even the lawyers who represent cases of journalists or rights defenders or activists, they get disbarred from the Bar Association for representing these cases. So the crackdown um, and this wave of censorship and intimidation kind of comes from all uh, corners. You know, it's not just about uh, targeting a journalist or blackmailing a journalist or uh, threatening them to take down their content or blocking their websites. It's also going after the lawyers who represent them. It, it's, it's about going after their family members. Uh, and in cases where we have seen uh, journalists leave um, and start working from abroad, that has not stopped the intimidation or the, the threats against the journalists or their families. Because in a lot of these cases, 
the journalists leave first and they leave their families behind because it's not easy to take everyone out. And uh, numerous times we've seen how family members have been intimidated, how they've lost their jobs because their you know, family members are journalists living abroad and um, covering what's happening in the country. Um, and of course, there are news that are very sensitive to the authorities. You know, they don't want stories about corruption. They don't want stories about human rights violations. They don't want stories about um, how a state oil company, for instance, you know, washing money away is engaged in money laundering. Just recently, I was dealing, I was helping um, a journalist from an opposition YouTube channel to uh, argue a case with YouTube to return the videos that were taken down by YouTube as a result of fake takedown requests from um, actors based in the country, most likely affiliated with the government. Um, and those videos that were taken down were about the state oil company and about the officials working for the state oil company and this whole corruption allegation and, and the, the side businesses that were going on. So the type of um, harassment has also extended. You know, when, when back in, like back 10 years ago, we were talking about, you know, advocacy campaigns for journalists who were um, intimidated, arrested, jailed. Now we're also talking about this whole other level of digital threats, little, digital persecution um, that uh, journalists are facing, newsrooms are facing, and it's really hard to do journalism in that kind of environment because just when you think that you found a way out, when you finally have access to an audience or you finally can function, that is taken away from you because your website is blocked, uh, suddenly your social media account is compromised, your journalist who's reporting from the country is detained somewhere and your hands are tied because you can't really do much. Um, and I think the final sort of uh, cherry on, on cake was uh, this law that was adopted, um, passed by the parliament in December of last year, signed by the president at the beginning of this year, effective this year, uh, which at this point, you know, just when we thought that it can't get worse um, from a legal perspective, this is probably the, the end of independent journalism in the country because the new law not only uh, creates new barriers to exist as a media platform because it restricts the ownership, now the media owners must be citizens of Azerbaijan, it not only restricts the work of the journalists because it requires every single journalist who wants to work in a country as a journalist to register within this state media registry system that is now being created now that this law has passed. And the state made media registry, if you decide you don't want to register, they say it's voluntary, on a voluntary basis, but if you decide you don't want to register, you get no access. You can't attend government meetings, you can't cover uh, events because in the, in, in, if you get detained um, and if police checks your credentials, if you're not registered, then good luck to you dealing with, with, with the new um, situation that, that is created. Um, the new media law also can basically block websites on a whim. You know, before there was at least some kind of mechanism, even though not that anyone was following it, websites were getting blocked anyway. Uh, but it now has become official. You know, everything now is, is legally allowed and, and the authorities can basically do uh, what they want, when they want. Uh, and your, the, the mechanism of acting or fi fighting back is, is, is non-existent. Um, and I think one other, one last thing I want to mention, and I don't know how you know, other panelists think about it, and especially in Tijuana now that you know, Dorst has also been forced out and so many other outlets have been forced out. I was talking to another friend of mine who's a um, journalist and who's managing a media platform, exiled media platform, and um, you know, we, we focus so much on present when we talk about all the challenges that journalists face in, in, in authoritarian countries like Azerbaijan. Uh, we, f we don't think about the future. And I think this is one of uh, kind of most important things. Like when I think about future of journalism in Azerbaijan, it's really hard for me to imagine or even yeah, have some kind of positive projection because you have a very restrictive environment as it is. You also don't have access to really good journalism education because you end up studying in universities where the curriculum is decided by the Ministry of the Education. It's not um, open to 
development. It's very restrictive. It's, it's very old school. And so what kind of journalists are we raising or are we educating, preparing, and in what kind of environment they're going to be working in? And I think that, for me, is one of um, the biggest challenges to think of as a journalist myself who lives in exile, uh, but also thinking, like, what's the future uh, for journalism, uh, journalism in, in, in the country, so, yeah. Um, okay, well thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to ask a, a, a follow-up question that some will probably think is out of left field, but I don't think it's, it, it is entirely. I'm the, uh, the, the, the sole American on the panel, and um, uh, you know, and we're, we have the First Amendment and freedom of expression and all of that stuff. But if you dig a little bit uh, a little bit deeper, you see that we can also be fairly repressive, maybe not legally, but uh, there's various forms of corporate pressure which can be brought to bear. And that's also been true in terms of how um, big U.S. media companies have dealt with authoritarian governments like uh, China, for example. Um, you know, uh, Google has acceded to requests from the Chinese government, and I'm wondering if that has also taken place, whether Western media companies or tech companies have been implicated um, in uh, authoritarian practices towards journalism in countries like Russia and Kyrgyzstan and Azerbaijan. Maybe, Tukun, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, start us off. Uh, I'm trying to think about it, and uh, I don't remember any case where, for example, Google uh, would uh, uh, would obey to and, and Google would do something uh, something repressive. Uh, no, I, I'm not saying that they would do something repressive themselves, but they would accede to a request from an, yeah, an authoritarian so government. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, I. I don't think that we saw something in Russia. We saw only once. Uh, it was during the uh, the elections when uh, when uh, the app of uh, Alexei Navalny, the leader of opposition, right, the app was deleted from App Store. Right, and and Google Play, right? And Google Play, yes. Yeah, I think that's the only example. Right. Yeah. So that's the main one. But it's now, 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 for example, uh, YouTube is uh, is blocking accounts of uh, Russian officials. For example, mm -hmm. of Maria Zakharova, spokesperson of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Or they, this morning, they blocked the account of uh, Russian parliament. And the Russian government is uh, crazy about it. The Russian government is, is, is telling them to to restore the access to these uh, channels, but YouTube is answering that these channels are you know, breaking the rules of YouTube and it's not going to restore the access. That's why probably YouTube will be blocked. So. Right. Re Rina, do you have anything to Yeah, add? it's a little bit easy in Kyrgyzstan because the country is smaller than most of the global corporations. Um, but of course, global corporations like Google, they can be tricked into acting against independent media. For example, once we did election observation, and of course, we were getting prepared to put a lot of content on our main YouTube channel with violations. And our account on the evening before elections was actually blocked by YouTube for posting like harassment video and this harassment video, it was actually a cartoon how to do election observation. So probably it harassed somebody, but I don't think that it could have been classified as like. And we tried to appeal, and actually uh, YouTube responded to us that they looked at the video again and didn't find, uh, and they stood by their decision. And so we had to live through elections without our main YouTube channel. We used like auxiliary ones of our partners and so on. But after that, we started raising noise. Uh, our partners at OCRP published the stories that we were blocked for uh, such, and such a cartoon. And all of a sudden, uh, we were unblocked. All strikes disappeared, but YouTube or Google never uh, contacted us. They pretended as if it never happened, and we still uh, publicly demand explanation on their part, but we still never received anything like that. And 
of course, I think it was just it, it was not some kind of a policy by YouTube to ascend to wishes of Kyrgyz government, but they were tricked pretty efficiently, and it basically showed that they don't have anyone at YouTube who can actually understand Kyrgyz language. The explanation we got was it was a mistake. We never get any kind of. That's the only explanation that we got. We just started working all of a sudden. But if I may. Follow up on that? If I may follow up on, on this question? Yeah, you, you may follow up. I, I do want to leave a little bit of time for oh. questions. So uh, if you can be, uh, say your, your piece quickly, and we can, I, I'd like to have a, a couple at least questions. I need to get this off my chest. This is my therapy session. <laughs> uh, no, but like in, in terms of uh, platforms and companies specifically, I think they're complicit. Um, in contexts like um, authoritarian regimes in Azerbaijan, specifically because they don't understand the political context within which their platforms are being used um, and by whom these platforms are being used and for what purposes. And I think the reason why I say they're complicit is because once you realize the extent of your importance in these countries because you know this becomes the main medium for news platforms, for newsrooms, for journalists who are independent, who are not probably affiliated with newsrooms, and yet you still take your time responding. You don't explain fully why you're taking down the content. You don't stand um, in support of media freedom and, and rights of journalists. Then you become complicit. And it's okay if it happens once when you don't know it's not okay when it keeps happening and you therefore become an obstacle in access to information in media freedom in those countries. Okay, I would, I would very much like to uh, uh, open it up for uh, one or two questions. Um, okay, can you speak up and I'll repeat your question so that for the hometown audience. Did you get that whole question? Because my deafness is kicking in here. And uh, so why don't you repeat the question? For so the, the question was, how do you get over the guilt of using your colleagues who remain on the ground while you are in exile, right? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, so is that directed toward anybody in particular? No, not really. OK. I am the worst qualified person to answer this question because we don't have anyone in exile who still can travel freely. But I was thinking a lot how we'll get over this uh, guilt. And for example, uh, whoever stays, stays voluntarily. Of course, we'll try to uh, minimize risks for them. Maybe we can open like a separate media that will just do interviews again and get the information. And another mechanism that we are preparing for such uh, occurrence, we are trying to build very strong uh, network of citizen journalists and uh, right now, uh, I mean, it's a little bit long to describe how we do that, but uh, I hope by the time we are in exile, we'll have at least 10,000 citizen journalists and kind of good luck, good luck persecuting them. And we'll try to make sure that every one of them, if they do some sort of research or gather information, it will be so small and um, they will not be persecuted just for that. But we'll see, of course. But of course, it's very uh, heavy question that is waiting me even now. Tikhon, do you have people still in Russia who are there sort of surreptitiously, or has everybody left? And if everybody's left, uh, you know, what are your resources for reporting from uh, from Russia or on the situation in Russia? Well, I, I can say that we with this. Uh, uh, new YouTube channel, we only, it only exists uh, three weeks and we haven't, we haven't used uh, any journalists from Russia. But it's a very good question and it's a very complicated question. And this is the main question which we are discussing now when we're talking about future of, of DOS, this uh, 
uh, relaunch of the book. Uh, because there are two important questions. First is how to get information from Russia, and the second is how to deliver information into Russia. It will be digital iron curtain, which, uh, which obviously will get in stronger and stronger. Um, I don't have a direct answer to, to this question now. We are considering different options, and I think what I did not want to tell now is one of the, uh, one of the possible answers to this situation. But the ethical um, part of this story is very strong. I mean, you or me or so someone is sitting somewhere abroad and uh, ask someone in the country to, to work for, for them. That's, that's hard. Do you have anything to add to this? Or? I mean, all I can say, I, you know, I have not uh, uh, operated a newsroom, um, so for me, it's a different kind of experience, but um, thinking of my friends who have been on both ends, um, I can say that the guilt is there. Um, and I think the guilt stays with you. Um, and it's part of the new phenomenon of this new kind of journalism that exists in this world today. Uh, the only thing that could be done about this is to make sure that there are mechanisms in place, uh, whether you are a newsroom operating from exile and you have reporters on the ground, and if, whether you're a freelancer uh, working for an exiled newsroom, is to have a strategy, an exit plan, um, multiple strategies and multiple exit plans uh, to be able to protect yourself. Uh, but it is part of your existence. It becomes part of your existence, to be honest with you. I mean, it's, it's, it is what it is. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Um, Not yet. I think we ha we have to repeat the question. No. Do we see an erosion? Uh, do we see a uh, switch to s communication apps like Telegram right. in Romania given? Yeah. Hmm. No. No. Short but sweet. Okay, um, uh, if, there, if there's no other question, then um, we're actually going to end uh, 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 two minutes early. Um, ah, finally, uh, another taker. Uh. Go ahead. Yes, right. With YouTube blocked in Russia, uh, and with Tihon talking about launching, not yet, not, not yet. Sorry, not yet. Blocked in Russia, uh, and with Tihon's um, announcement of this new YouTube channel. What if YouTube is blocked? Uh, what are the plans? Uh, if this happens, how you intend to reach your audience in this situation? saying that uh, this is the second uh, most important uh, question, how to get to the audience. You know, I, I, I maybe am naive, but uh, I am absolutely sure that technologies are always one step ahead uh, of the repressions. And uh, I think that there are always ways to get through the, the uh, restriction. For example, now when uh, Facebook is blocked in Russia, I still talk to a lot of my Moscow friends on Facebook because they all are 
particular for for the issue it will be will be harder because dpm only because for for, for the dpm so it's hard to to get so many traffic as as uh, right. uh dpm but um <clears throat> i i uh, i understand that of course this threat the strategy of Russian government uh, is somehow working because the number of people who have who has access to the independent information is getting smaller because people are lazy. For example, while I lived in Russia, I never had people. Uh, I, I should have probably, uh, and I understand that uh, a lot of people will not not use it. Um, but this is our our goal to to find out how to reach to as many people as as possible, and that's why we talk to a lot of tech people to understand what are the. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much to all of you. I think the the the, the takeaway, the big takeaway for me uh, from the panel uh, was uh, Renat's point: be prepared for exile. Right, and uh, you know, make sure that um, that uh, that when you're working in an authoritarian country uh, like this, or running in a newsroom, that uh, you, you have the options in advance. I'd like to thank everybody for coming and and uh, and listening. Um, it was very interesting discussion, and uh, thank you again to the participants, and thank you to you, Tikhan, for for, for for zooming in. Okay. Thank you.